Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Emmett Emery Sr., You Better Stand Your Watts Leader and Leadership Podcast. Today, I have a special guest. Well, I'm always having a special guest, but this is a little bit more special um, because she's a, she's a good friend of a friend. Um, so that, that, that makes it special in itself. Um, we're going to cover today uh, the qualities of leader and leadership. Uh, before we get started, um, check this out. This is my book. I talked about it last time. It's in two volumes, volume one and volume two. Volume one is English, volume two is Spanish. I'm asking you to purchase my book. Buy it, get it, hold on to it. Whatever you need to do with it, then find me, I'll sign it. And also, subscribe to me. All right, here we go. Let's get this podcast started. Uh, my guest to get today is, is named uh, Nicole, Nicole Payne. Nicole, tell my audience about yourself. Good evening, Dr. Emmett. It's a pleasure to have been invited uh, to come and talk to you and your audience today. Um, as you stated, my name is Nicole Payne, and I'm running for County Commissioner of District 6, uh, which is uh, East Hillsborough County. That's it? Nothing else? Well, I'm waiting for you to, you know, set up the hit. <laughs> Go ahead and pitch. Um, I can talk all day until the t- cows come home about what I've done and, and who I am and so forth. And But I can give you a, a, a little summary. Um, I am originally from the Bronx, New York, born and raised in New York City. New York and... Yes, New York. Um, and... Uh, uh, I am someone who has a, a financial background um, in business finance, management, as well as education. And, uh, and it was pretty accidentally how I got into finance and, really? and education. Yeah. You know, coming from the Bronx, I had been uh, uh, the product of a parent, a single parent who was on welfare and there weren't very many people in my neighborhood that exhibited any kind of financial success. So mm. those kind of conversations uh, weren't had in, in my family at kitchen tables or anything. And um, I, uh, early on, uh, thought that I knew enough to get by, and I dropped out of high school. And I started working in the entertainment industry, um, looking to get into writing and producing and so forth. And I you struck out pretty early and uh, wind up starting a family and eventually realized that, well, I think I need to go to school and get this little piece of paper you know, that everyone else is talking about. So I did get my GED. And in between jobs, um, I was stuck at an airport. And I struck up a conversation with this stranger that was sitting next to me. And it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the flights were very much delayed. Uh, kind of what's going on right now mm-hmm. with most passengers uh, globally, what they're experiencing. But I'm sitting in the airport, struck up a conversation with this gentleman. And at the end of the conversation, he said, you know what? He said, it sounds like you've got a lot of business sense, and I think you'd be perfect for my business. And he handed me his business card, and he happened to be the national recruiter for a company called Solomon Smith Barney. Mm. And, uh, and, I, and I looked it up, and I said, oh, goodness, it's a financial firm. I don't know anything about finance. I hated math in school. But I said, I'll just show up for the interview and see what happens from there. And so I get uh, to their Atlanta office. And at the time, I was living in Virginia. But I get to their Atlanta office and um, got set up with an interview, did a mock Series 7 examination, which I failed miserably, but they hired me anyway. Wow. The hiring manager said that, you know, I, I think that you have the skill set uh, that would be perfect for this business. And so he hired me to be an assistant for five of the stockbrokers so I can kind of learn the business. How old were you this time? I was 24. Wow, you was young. Yes, I was 24. And um, I get there and I get excited and, you know, I had clients that were calling that were part-time teachers for, you know, 30 years. And they're calling and they're saying, you know, they want to cash out their retirement account. They're, you know, collecting um, stocks and, and millions of dollars is, is running through hands. And I got really excited. And I said, you know, I wish that someone would have explained math to me in terms of money. Because I hated math, but I loved money. <laughs> and I wanted to learn everything I could about investing. 
And I started reading all the books that I can, um, started brushing up on my knowledge so that I can pass uh, an exam. And I wanted to start a business. I wanted to start BWIN, which was Black Women's Investment Network. Wow. And I said, I'm going to take this information to my hood because somebody needs to tell us right, about this. Right. And, and that was my first disappointment that I got because nobody that I knew was remotely interested in risking anything that they had in the stock market. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what 401ks were. And, and I'm, you know, frustrated because I'm like, you know, you guys are spending a hundred dollars on Jordans. You spending $50 at the movies Mm -hmm. and, you know, other things we can invest and we can become wealthy. And so not to destroy all my friendships, what I decided to do is just, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. Mm -hmm. And if someone is ready for this information, they will come to me. And so I began focusing on my career. It's um, interesting that you um, took the route of communicating with the community mm-hmm. versus communicating through the church. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to embody what I wish someone had been for me. Each one, teach one, each one, reach one. Right. And I, I wanted to spread this information of financial education. And, and it wasn't well received. And so, like I said, I was, mm. you know, disappointed, mm-hmm. but... I wasn't going to get rid of all my friends. Right. So I just started focusing on my own career and I became a financial advisor. I got into mortgages, um, in which I stayed in the mortgage industry for quite some time and and learned how to buy properties and became a real estate investor. Wow. And I, and at this time I was a single mom. I was a single mom with four kids. How old were you at this time? Um, at this time I was about 30 did, did you have a mentor? Um, unofficially. You I did was, all this with an unofficial mentor? Unofficial mentor. Wow. So I was taking notes from people who were successful. That is sharp. And I, I watched what they did. I watched how they dressed. I watched how they addressed people. I watched, uh, you know, everything that I could, you know, taking mental notes, asking questions. Um, I did. I asked a lot of questions. And during this time... I, I did not have a college degree, and and I didn't want to be found out about being mm. undereducated. And so, you know, I tried to fake it as much as I could. But I was being held back because there were certain leadership positions that I wasn't attaining. I could only get but so far. Mm-hmm. You know, I had, you know, low management uh, positions, supervisor positions, but I couldn't excel. And so eventually I thought maybe I should go back to school and finish this, you know, education. And I started going back to school um, and started working on my bachelor's degree in business management and criminal justice. And I I got into the education industry a little bit by accident. After the crash of 2008, and I lost a lot of properties, lost a lot of money. I'm working on my education, and I needed to do an internship um, to complete my program. And I thought, well, let me start with the financial aid office, you know, Mm. the school that I was going to. And one conversation led to another, and they were like, wow, we think that you'll be perfect to work with our, um, our high school liaison department and go to the high schools and talk to them about education, you know, uh, college and so forth. And they said, just go ahead and put together a presentation for us. And, you know, we'll do a little interview. And I put together a PowerPoint presentation, had a a panel interview, and they hired me on the spot. What state was this? This was in Virginia. This was in Virginia. So I started going out to high schools, talking to guidance counselors, going into classrooms. Next thing I know, they're asking me to um, teach their whole class and talk about business management. And and I'd get the teacher the day off for, you know, the time that I was there from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. I'm teaching the students about investing principles, financial management, life after high school skills. And then I started getting invitations to come to the church and start speaking to adults about Mm. this. And then I started going to uh, the juvenile delinquent centers and talking to the kids there. And so it was great. There was no money in, uh, in education like it was when I was in the financial services industry. But it was keeping me involved in the community. Right, right. And so during this time, I was starting to get a little involved in in politics. I started helping out uh, um, uh, Mayor Wilder 
uh, in Richmond was uh, was running. Uh, he had been the first black governor in Virginia. Right. And so I was helping a little bit with that campaign. And then I started working with Habitat Humanity and, you know, just helping a little, you know, stuff in, in, in a community here and there. And then the last project I was working on was uh, with the Urban League. And so I was um, the, the right-hand man, if you will, to the president uh, of the Urban League mm-hmm. of, of Greater Richmond. And I really became heavily involved in community work. After that, I started working with another prof- nonprofit organization, New Visions, New Ventures, that helped women and minorities with business plans, uh, learning how to navigate through lending, micro lending, when it was starting to, to take off. And did that for a while until I, I met a brick wall. Mm. And I, I finished my bachelor's degree, but there was still this this hold back uh, that I was experiencing of excelling to the next level. And uh, and and after a while, um, you know, I wanted to move to Florida. I had made a little pit stop in Florida years before, and I wanted to go back. And so um, at this time, I'm already married. And I told my husband, I said, you know, when I met you. I, I told you I used to live in Florida, and I plan on moving back someday. And I said, well, I got a, a plane ticket, a job interview, and at least an apartment. Um, are, are you coming? Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he just thought it was a phase that I was going through. And he's like, <laughs> oh, okay, well, you just go figure this out. And, you know, I'll wait here, keep everything, you know, uh, holding down. And, and so um, I moved down to Florida, and I was in uh, West Palm Beach. And, you know, we visit each other back and forth and and he saw that I was pretty serious about staying in Florida so eventually he's like all right we'll rent out the house and got back into uh, property management and I was working at another university down in West Palm Beach I kept on feeling like it was time for me to get back into financial services you know I, I had missed it and I did so right before the pandemic um, I decided to go back into uh, finances, and uh, and I started working with mortgages. Well, first I started work, working with a, um, an online trading company that uh, taught people how to invest in stocks, uh, futures, forex, all that stuff. And uh, then I eventually got back into mortgages. And so when I when I got back into the financial services industry, I'm teaching other people on how to build a a successful financial career. I'm mentoring young college graduates, um, uh, teaching them the fundamentals of of investing and and selling and, and client management and relationships and and so forth. Um, all this time, I have had friends and family uh, with kitchen table discussions about topics from A to Z. And anyone who knows me knows that I don't shy away from any topic. You can talk to me about anything. My husband does not like to talk about politics, religion, sexual orientation. He, he doesn't really dive into those conversations. I don't know how he does it because it's easy to bait me into it. And um, Well, you are an individual of your word. You said you could talk all night about yourself. And you, that was the truth. And I didn't believe it, but now I believe it now. Because there's a long story, so, right? Uh, I asked Nicole to, to elaborate a little bit more mm-hmm. because she had an interesting background uh, from what I was told. I hadn't really heard a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And you could, you could see the path that she took. And for the individuals and, and the young kids that feel that you cannot succeed if some kids don't like high school. They, they might be better off getting a GED or you don't have anything beyond a high school degree. Mm-hmm. Well, you can succeed. Mm-hmm. And that first step takes you further along. All right, let's get into this topic. Uh, leaders and leadership qualities that make or break leaders and leadership. Leadership qualities are a set of traits that a leader has that helps them to succeed in their role. These qualities either, either can come naturally or be learned over time. There are several qualities that a good leader should have, including intelligence, assertion, empathy, interested motivation, flexibility, ambition, self-confidence, optimism, hard work, determination, prevalence, concern for people, respect for others, excellent communication skills, knowledge of the field, 
Any other ones you want to add to that? <laughs> you, you're covering a pretty wide gambit of, uh, of qualities. It's very rare that you find someone with all of that, right? Um, they may have a few here and there. Um, they may have one, and some may have none. Do you have a servant? Yes. Mm-hmm. Me. I'm a servant leader. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 15 qualities. She said you very fel- seldom find someone with one. That's cool because you found someone 15. No, I'm just playing with God. I got some, but I'm not going to tell you which one they are. A survey of 195 leaders from more than 30 global organizations suggests that there are five major themes of competencies that strong leaders exhibit. High intellectual standards and in providing a safe environment. Empowering individuals to self-organize. Promoting connection and belonging among employees. Some of these things are mentioned. Um, Nicole mentioned it in her in our intro, open to new ideas and, and experimentation, committed to professional and intellectual growth of employees. She didn't get found too much employees. She's telling you about her, how she succeeded uh, coming from down below. And the reason I, I, I wanted to hear more uh, on our background because I'm from Chicago and she's from New York. And when she stated that she was observant and she, she looked around and, and she listened and, and she communicated, well, we both have two different perspectives on that avenue. She did that so she can learn more. In Chicago, I did that to watch my back. I was trying to see who was around me, so I was watching my back. I was looking, I was learning, I was listening to make sure. I was looking to see if I had a way out. You know, if you, if you see them coming left, you got to make sure you go right. We both looked in a different perspective from that, and she was more successful. I'm more in survival mode. Now, Nicole, I want you to explain the following leader's leadership skills, traits, and quality. I'm going to state, I'm gonna state it, and, I'm, and then I'm going to state what I mean by it, and then I want you to elaborate. Creativity. Solving problems innovatively. One of the, the qualities that I admire is um, the ideation. People with ideas people with creativity. You know, you learn how to solve problems um, very early in life when you're given puzzles, you know, you're given uh, uh, toys to play with, and you break them up and you put them back together mm-hmm. and um, or you're taking a piece of paper with a crayon to it and you're creating something out of your imagination. And, uh, and, and that is the beginning steps of being able to solve problems is learning how to create and solve and solve little puzzles i don't know if we do enough of that in our schools we're, we're taking away the arts and you know people who are into the arts are are problem solvers right they don't look at the world just in black and white you know they look at it in very abstract terms uh they can turn something upside down inside out and make something out of it and um you know people who um create are our problem solvers, and we need to look more towards that, uh, which is why we need to keep on investing in the arts, uh, in our schools. Those are your future problem solvers. You wouldn't say that creativity started in the household? Yes. Yes, I would. Because I learned how to be creative at age five. Mm -hmm. I stayed in the trouble. I could get my butt whooped. So Mm -hmm. I had to be creative on how I can resist all that pain that was coming toward me from the belt and anything else and the shoes and Mm -hmm. everything that mom was giving me. And more from the neighbors than from her. Right. So. Yeah. And you do need that. You you need that kind of artistic stimulation. Um, You know, right now you see in our society that we're giving our children flat screens to play with. Yeah. Cell phones, tablets and so forth. Um, Although some of them may have little games and, and, but there's something about the real 3d, 4d uh, um, aspect of life that if you're given paper, crayons, boxes, you know, what have you, and you're, you're figuring things out. It does start at home uh, to give challenges to your children. It, It teaches you how to think outside the box. You're, you're learning critical thinking skills very early on. And, and as a, you know, a one-year-old, two-year-old, you don't really know what you're doing, but you're building upon these successes and failures of creating, figuring things out. And the reason I said that is because the creativity into the workplace with leaders and leadership, and it gives you more towards strategic thinking mm-hmm. and planning, the creativity part. And that's why some researchers like to argue back and forth about if, is leadership learned or were you born born with it? Because the creativity it could be both. 
right? creativity sneaks in. Yeah, it could be both. You know, we, we have nurture and nature, right? And some of us may be naturally inclined to create. Um, some of us have to be put in that environment and with practice over time, we learn these behaviors. You know, if you, if you look at it as that, you know, nature is your blank canvas. Yes, yes. And nurture is the, the paint mm-hmm. that some of your teacher, parent or whatever is giving you. Um, so you can learn those creativity tools. You need that in the workforce, right? Because those are your people who are figuring out your problems. Many managers want to have worker bees. So what do you consider a brush to be? The brush is a, it's a tool, it's a medium, but anything could be a brush. Yes. Next, empathy. Understanding others' feelings. This is a, uh, I think it's a big issue Mm -hmm. in in the workforce. Not so much that the individual don't understand others' feelings, I think sometime either they stuck focus on policy procedures or I can even go a little harsh to the right and say they just don't care. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that, right? And, you know, you get your empathy. Um, it stems from your emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, empathy, the ability to uh, understand your own emotions but maybe understand others, yes. right? And sometimes you have people who can do both and you have people who are good at one or the other. What we lack oftentimes, especially in the environment that we're in in present day America, is a lack of empathy sometimes for uh, people who don't look like ourselves, um, whether that is the, uh, a gender uh, um, issue or a racial issue, but we, we do lack a lot of empathy and it, it's probably not enough stimulation uh, in the family, um, not enough stimulation, real world connectivity, because we are so um, into our devices. And and it, there's psychologists that have said that it, it is hard for a child to grasp the true emotional depth and, 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 and breadth of emotions if they're looking at a flat screen. You know, there's the nuances in facial expressions. If you're not giving your child enough face time, you can uh, arrest their development in the empathy sector. Mm-hmm. When I was working on my doctor's degree, me and another doctor, we uh, did a little research on, on empathy. And we focused, he was Hispanic, we focused the research on the minority community. Mm-hmm. We wanted to see, is does, does empathy come from that minority community from past experience that someone suffer, understanding others, or does it come from reading an individual? By reading an individual, I mean understanding facial expression, understanding body language, understanding the topic, understanding tone of voice. And we found out that 60% of that finding came from background experience. You can look in the black and brown community and you you know that there's plenty of empirical evidence to show that uh, there are challenges that we face that our white peers do not have to encounter and we feel we have uh, a lot of emotions uh, raw emotions to contend with from very early ages uh, we are thrusted into the realm of racism right you know even women are very early on thrust into the the realms of sexism, right? And, yes. You know, there's all kinds of isms and so forth. But, you know, we're forced to deal with these raw emotions. We see our parents come home with it, you know, of the microaggressions and, you know, even the, the um, you know, obvious aggressions, mm-hmm. right? And we see our parents and our brothers and sisters go through all of these these uh, transgressions, and then we start to experience it ourselves. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a, a reservoir of emotions and, and physical expressions, body language to really uh, draw from when we are assessing our own and we're s- assessing others. So we can be a little bit more sensitive to what towards what other people are going through. We're experiencing a lot of things firsthand and, um, you know, where our, our white peers may never 
experience the racism that we experience. And, you know, they can argue reverse racism, but we know that it's not the same uh, that we experience. So we do have a, a very big reservoir of issues that we have to grapple with and we learn how to get through it. Um, that life doesn't always go our way and we have to suck it up and keep moving forward. Yes, and that's you you learn through generations. Mm -hmm. And that's not a generation curse. Right. That's generation fact. Right. And and unfortunately we we pass down these things because these these stressors do affect us at the at, at the the DNA level, right? And, and, you know, there's plenty of studies that show that you can pass these things on um, from mother to child. Yes. Uh, because yes. these things will, can alter your DNA. And so if you're a man, it can alter your DNA before you even impregnate a woman. Yes. As, as a woman, I mean, we're all, women are born with their eggs from, from birth, but there's also other kind of chemical changes that we can go through when we are under stress. And so we can pass these things, unfortunately, on to our children. You know what they're saying, research, some research is saying now? They're saying that a lot of the aggression from the young kids, the violence with the weapons and things of that nature, mm -hmm. they're trying to tie it in to uh, military war veterans, mm -hmm. DNA. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's cool because... I'm a military war veteran, mm -hmm. and my kids is not aggressive mm -hmm. from uh, the war mm -hmm. stage. They're aggressive because they was kids, mm -hmm. and kids are aggressive with their that age. And mm -hmm. a lot of the, a lot of kids put the aggression into sports and make them more competitive with right. other kids. Well, the important thing is that you have to have an outlet yes. for those aggressions. Yes. And, and thank you for your service, by the way. Thank you. Um, you know, when when children are coming of age and the hormones are being introduced to the body and it makes them feel, uh, you know, overly anxious and aggressive about things that may be trivial and they may be uh, uncharacteristically happy about things that really aren't funny or... And, you know, they have these emotions where they just don't know what to deal with, it, do, do with it. And, uh, and if you have good parents, good mentors, coaches, teachers in your life, you can find outlets until you can regulate, you know, these emotions. Um, but all children feel anger at some point, you know, things that they can't even understand. Uh, they just don't know that it's a phase that they're going through that they will get out um, but if they have, again, the, the right people in their lives, you can do sports, you can do creative arts, you know, you can do studies, academics, or what have you. But it ha you have to train the mind to disperse all that outside noise and have inner peace somewhere. Well, I know this 40-year-old man going through all that right now. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get him on board? <laughs> Next, integrity, mm -hmm. having strong moral values and honesty. Yeah. That, in the, in the leaders and leadership perspective, uh, a lot of that is on display when an individual is following the guidance, the proper guidelines, proper procedures, doing what's right, mm -hmm. and not deviating mm -hmm. uh, because uh, from their moral values. So if I got a religious, my religious background, my religion is telling me that I got to pray for five minutes at lunch. The discipline in me because of my integrity and my moral values, they're going to help me step away mm -hmm. for five, 10 minutes to do that. And I'm going to, I'm going to express that interest to my boss. My boss understand what I'm, what I'm going for five, 10 minutes. And I'm going to do it during my break, my lunch break. More value and honesty. Honesty is talking to the individual, letting them know exactly what, where you're coming from with it. Mm -hmm. You know, my, um, my take on in integrity, um, ethics, honesty, is that it's non-negotiable. Um, I am responsible to a higher power. Yes. Um, I, I am keenly aware of who I am and how I operate in the world. People see a black woman, and I know that I'm scrutinized much more than my white peers. Um, not complaining. That's just you know, the way that yeah, it is. You got to deal with it, right? I can't get away 
with certain things, even trivial things that my white peers may be able to get get away with. Uh, they're given the benefit of the doubt where I may not be given the benefit of the doubt. And I have to prove myself. And yeah, constantly. Constantly. And the only thing that I have uh, for me is my reputation, right? And so once your reputation is tarnished, that's it. You yes. know, pack up, move out of town. Yes. So for me, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Yes. And for me, that's non-negotiable. Because I tell my workers, I tell my kids too, do the right thing when no one's looking. I said, however, remember, there's always going to be someone looking. Mm-hmm. I said, and that someone is the word of mouth that go around and tell people that you're not doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Yep, and unfortunately, there'll be people making it up. As well. Exactly. And so you need to have evidence. You need to have character and you need people to know you. You need a reputation behind you of being able to do the right thing. You know, in in honesty, I have no problem telling people, yes, I did it. No, I didn't. My mother used to have a saying, I said it, I meant it, and I'm here to represent it. (laughs) And don't ever say anything (laughs) that you can't defend if you're confronted with it. Right? So... You know, I, I move in the space with honesty. And one, I can do that because I have a clean heart. So my heart leads me. I, I don't have any ill intentions towards anybody. So that frees me up to be ethical, to be honest, to have integrity. And, and, and for me, it's an easy one. I, I don't have any conflicts. If you had to put a percentage out of 100% on honesty, how much of a percentage Will you tie that honesty into character? Oh, I mean, I, I would say that's 100%. Mm. 100%, I mean, easily. Without honesty, then yes, your whole entire character mm-hmm. comes into question. You know, now the, we can go into the micro, you know, analysis of No, it. let's not do that. You know, <laughs> however, <laughs> how, however, you know, for, for the sake of this conversation is that, Be honest. It makes it easier. Um, My grandmother used to have a a, a saying, um, oh, what a web we weave once we practice to deceive. (laughs) You're killing me with what you can say. (laughs) So so just be honest. Most people can't keep track of the lies that they tell anyway. So it makes it easier. Be honest. Uh, Producer, write down these these little sayings she said, because we're going to say these later. (laughs) (laughs) Next, humility. Not being arrogant Mm -hmm. or assertive. So there's a time and a place, right? Um, many people can interchange and, and confuse uh, confidence with arrogance. And I have been accused of being a humble person, but I'm also a saleswoman and I like a little friendly competition. And so, I, you know, I can, I can get a little arrogant when I need to, be a little confident and cocky when I need to. But for the most part, my, my, my true spirit is that I'm a very down-to-earth, humble person. Mm-hmm. I don't think of myself as greater than, than all or, 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 or many. You know, I'm, I'm another human being, and I'm, a, I'm another cog in the wheel uh, on this earth. But for friendly competition, you know, f- you know, if I have a sales team, you know, we'll do a little banter back and forth, um, which, you know, could be said if you didn't know me very well, you're like, oh, that's a cocky person right there. But for the most part, I'm humble. I think a lot of people confuse uh, cocky with confidence. Mm -hmm. And that confidence pretty much is a, is a, is a, 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 I say a prelude um, and an offspring of your character. Mm -hmm. Because your character is who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of variable attached to that that character. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to be successful in, in any field, especially as a, a leader or, or in the field of leadership and teaching, mm-hmm. you have to have the confidence and the ability to get it done. Right. Well, it, I mean, it has to start with confidence because if you're, if, if you're not displaying it, which is the belief in yourself, mm-hmm. then how is anybody else going to believe you? Exactly. And, and people are drawn to confidence. When I would mentor uh, young ladies and, you know, we talk about uh, dressing and, you know, and it's a topic that, you know, is kind of touchy, uh, criticizing and, 
lecturing women on how to dress, you know, what is proper, what is improper, but... Sound like you're in church. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would tell young ladies that, um, you know, just as much as you can put on a mini skirt and, and high heels and you can walk with your head high and be confident that you look good, you can also put on pants, you know, turtleneck sweater, jacket, and be confident as well. What feedback you get with that? Um, most of them just stop and, you know, they never considered that. And, you know, they're mm, thinking about it, like didn't put it that way. Some of the young ladies, especially in, in co-ed schools, they're, they're vying for the attention of the, the young boys. But I've also gone to all girls schools and they don't have that problem. Really? Girls are not walking around with mini skirts and heels and, and, you know, so forth. No one's lecturing them on, hey, you know, you're revealing too much because there's no boys for them to. They're not to distracted. Really, they're not distracted by that. So um, many of them just, you know, wore regular clothing, you know, loose fitting, whatever, just regular stuff. And so. But um, you go to all boys school. It doesn't matter the female there now, they're still distracted because they're talking about the female. They got pictures. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh-huh. Most leadership categories are all about how a person behaves when they're leading a group. When really you should be focusing on the things that you already know that are easier to identify. Your natural patterns of excellence. These natural strengths tell you more about why you lead the way you do and how you lead best than about what kind of leader you are. According to Gallup polls, for example, influencing. Maybe something you are naturally drawn to as a leader is being vocal and being someone who is always in front of the room. This could be your communication thing. You don't always have to lead from the front of the room. Um, As a matter of fact, if you're out in the front too far, people can see you as the enemy. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes you can lead from within and showing your team or your mentees how it's done rather than telling them how to do it. Showing it is is, is much better. But leadership... How about leading from our example? Yeah, for for me, it has always been to show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, And I'm a firm believer that leaders create other leaders. Yes, yes. I cannot move on to the next stage without having the person come behind me. And I'm always looking towards who that next leader is going to be so I can begin to move on. I look at, at similar to what you're saying, actually exactly, but I put it a little bit further. Mm-hmm. I feel that if I'm a leader, I should be training the next leader to take my place. Mm-hmm. I should be training them to do, mentoring them to do the same thing that I'm doing so that when I move on, it doesn't miss a beat. Mm -hmm. It's having a succession plan. Yes. Um, And all organizations need to have a succession plan. It is, it it is, goes back to, you know, what I'd said before that each one teach one, Mm -hmm. each one reach one. And, uh, and, and that's how we continue to have the world go round is developing other leaders, uh, not hoarding information, not fearful that you're going to be replaced. I should hope to be replaced. That's what I look towards is replace me so that I can move forward. Yes. And keep it going. Mm -hmm. Strategic thinking could be the leader who was energized by brainstorming sessions, who loves thinking about all the things that could be your ideation theme. Mm -hmm. What's think? I was just talking to a couple of friends earlier today that my brain doesn't shut off. That's not good. It, <laughs> there's, there's, there's really you no have to have a rest period. No rest. No rest for the weary. Um, it, there's constant background stuff. E- even when I meditate, you know, and you're supposed to empty your mind. Right. Yeah, that never happens. Wow. No. So you're not meditating. It, it, it's constantly <laughs> pushing back. I can focus on maybe one thing. For a short period of time. That's mom traits. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, there's background programs going on, but you try to think strategically, solve problems, 
um, before they become yes. a problem, right? So it's being proactive. Right. And, you know, and I always say, you know, if you stay ready, you never have to get ready. So I have a lot of what if scenarios running around in the background. And Did you um, write that down? Yeah, write that right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking notes. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> but but in life, you do need strategies, you know, and, and oftentimes um, we're not thinking strategically enough. Um, and even in your partnerships, whether they're relationships or, you know, business relationships, you should be thinking yes. about their strategies and their mission and end goals and, and how it aligns with yours, whether you need to adjust your sales or not. So, you know, I'm, I'm constantly problem solving. Um, I, I enjoy the, the problems, you know, but no, excuse me, not the problems. Oh, I, say, girl. No, <laughs> I enjoy thinking about the solutions. That's better. Yeah. Thinking about the solutions for the problems, because I, I'm also a firm believer that the universe is so well balanced mm -hmm. that for every problem, there's equally a solution for it. Yes. We may not know it and we may not have it today. We may not have it tomorrow. But there are solutions. And so it's part of the discovery process of figuring things out. You know, on my desk, I have a reminder. I thought that I coined this term, but apparently I, I may not have. Or maybe I did and someone copied it off of me. But <laughs> everything is figure outable. Did you write that one down? <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> um, and so I, and that's the way that I approach life. Everything can be figured out. Um, and I will put the, the, the time and, and brain power, um, researching, asking questions, mm -hmm. asking other successful people, people that I, that I may know have been in that situation, um, looking for other successes. How important is feedback? Oh, feedback is very important, right? Um, and you're going to get some feedback whether you like it yes, or not, yes. right? And so you have to kind of, you know, filter through that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 16 years old, a friend of mine gave me some advice that you take the best and you leave the rest, right? And so filtering through some of that, that feedback, but it, it should come from people that you respect and admire. Yes. Take the right? best, leave the rest. Yeah. I'm so, next, make sure I send it to my wife, see how far I get with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Executing. Or maybe you find yourself being the leader who is always pushing their team to go further, mm -hmm. reach higher, and continually challenging themselves. This could be your achiever thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yes. Um, you know, being in sales is always a constant goal. The, the marker is always being moved. Like, oh, yes, you did great yesterday, but what can you do today, right? Mm -hmm. And so and, and even because of the nature of uh, the way our society is set up, we are in a capitalistic society. Right. right. And so, you know, more, 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 right? We're always being pushed to achieve higher, uh, you know, do greater things. Records are always needing to be set and broke and set again. And Is that good or bad when we put that pressure on the kids? Um, well, it, it depends on who you are. So, I mean, we have so many different, you know, personality types. That kind of pressure is good for some and it's mm. not good for others. Mm -hmm. so you just have to know what kind of kid you have. Mm -hmm. I, I have four and, um, you know, all four of them are different. Um, some of them can take the pressures and some of them can't. Some of them thrive off of it. Some of them love it. Give me, give me more challenges. You know, who else can I beat? And, you know, while I have another, it's like, eh, I'm not interested. And, you know, <laughs> I got you one like have, that. You can have that title. I have four know? and my oldest like that. Yeah. But the other three are so competitive. Yeah. But my personality type is I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. I want to push myself to the limits. I want to see what else I can do. Uh, that's my own natural curiosities. I understand that there are people that are not very curious right, to right. what they can do. They're fine with being who they are. And there absolutely is nothing wrong with that, right? You don't want to admonish someone who is not a high achiever. You're going to need those worker bees. And whenever I would look at my employees, and then I had my stars, like, okay, that's great. You know, you're a top star, but I know that stars burn out, mm -hmm. right? And I know that you're going to, you know, get to the point where you've reached all the successes that you can, and then you're going to leave my team. So while that I, that's great, you know, I applaud you for your accomplishments because it's always great to give them that feedback. But then I look at the, the vast middle who are your kind of, you know, the 
you can depend on them. You can either depend on them to achieve the goal or just come under the goal, just go above the goal, but you kind of know what you get with those those folks, and they're yes. not going to really do much more. And then you have your underachievers. And with those underachievers, you try to analyze, okay, do you have the capacity to come up to the middle or even go beyond the middle? Yes. Or is this just not the right thing for you? Exactly. And, um, and so once you analyze who you're working with, you should know as a leader how much pressure to apply. Yes. Relationship building. Ty, right into what you're saying. Or maybe you are the type of leader who listens to everyone's individual story and sees unique value that every follower brings to your team. This could be your individualization theme. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I appreciate people for who they are. You show me who you are. I'm not going to make you something that you're not or just turn you into something that I want you to be. Who are you? Tell me what you want for yourself. And then let's see how we can achieve that mm -hmm. together. And so looking at people as individuals is, is very important. You know, our American society, we're a very individualistic society. We all want to be recognized for who we, who we are, um, our own wants and needs. And there are some other societies, collectivist societies, that you know a little bit different. They hide behind the accomplishments. Right. Um, but I do look at um, individuals, and I, and I think that is important uh, for, for some people is to be recognized, and, and, and especially, you know, with uh, you know, social media being what it is, people are just kind of blended into this social group. And there's a billion people on one app, and it's hard for them to stand right. out, and so they don't feel like they're being recognized or seen. Um, even sometimes in families, when you have multiple children, some children feel left out that they're not being seen, and uh, and and that's because you know our society uh, prides themselves on recognizing the individual and so um and so i i do that i i stop to recognize individuals listen to them i i, I probably get more than what i would want to because a lot of people love talking to me about their individual and uniqueness and their unique situations that they're going through but but i will stop and acknowledge people as the individuals that they are and try to find something in them that I can appreciate. So you, it sounds like you consider um, recognition as a motivator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pew Research Center, September 20th, 2018, surveyed by Julia Messiscana, I've been messing names, <laughs> Horsey, Ruth, Ingrid Link, and Kim Parker. Talked about female leaders as a more compassionate, empathetic than man individual. For most of the, of the other qualities tested in the survey, Majority of adults say that there is not any difference between men and women. Mm -hmm. so you smile, huh? However, <laughs> however, among those who do see a difference, women tend to be viewed as stronger than men on most qualities. Two examples that apply to both is politics and business, which are being honest and ethical. And standing up for what they believe in. You talked about honesty to a great extent. You talked about ethicalness to a great extent. I was waiting until I got to this part mm -hmm. to show that that part is true because that you focus on those two areas to a great extent. And standing up for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. Roughly three in 10 adults mm -hmm. say female leaders. <sighs> I got to say this. I, I got to say it. It's the research. I got to say the research. <sighs> Three in 10 adults say female leaders do a better job than men at being honest and ethical. 31% said in politics and 30% in business. While relatively, few say men do a better job than women. 4% in politics <laughs> and 3% in business. Your feedback. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> But okay, yeah, we, we, we can talk about this one. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> um, so I um I, and I told you I was got my bachelor's degree and then I went on and got my master's degree and uh, and this year I'll be defending my dissertation, getting my doctorate. So uh, soon enough, thank you. I'll be Doctor Payne. And so my research is in uh, the emotional intelligence 
of women leaders in the financial industry hmm. and how it relates to their job satisfaction. And so in my research, I have been coming across a lot of data that uh, sh shows that women exhibit higher levels of emotional intelligence. And why is that important? Because it is often linked, high levels of emotional intelligence is often linked to uh, effective leadership. And so when you peel back those layers, and you're like, well, well, why aren't women, you know, getting promoted by leaps and bounds to being, you know, leadership positions? Well, there's a lot of other stuff that comes with that, right? right. Because it is a misunderstanding that women don't know how to control their emotions, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is not the case because it, it, the, the studies show that women do know how to regulate their emotions. The fact that women release tears doesn't mean that she's out of control. It's a part of the regulation. And so when you're looking at the leadership and you're looking for people who are compassionate, who exhibit empathy, who exhibit honesty and ethics, Yes, those are qualities that women do excel at. And that's not to say all, right? Because when you have people that enter the conversation that may not have read the research themselves, you're like, well, I know one of my bosses, you know, was evil. She was, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are anomalies. Um, but yes, yeah, studies do show that women are effective leaders. And um, and we should have more programs uh in the workplace to help foster that. And it doesn't mean that you have to choose women over men. You should always be choosing the person who is right for the particular position because there are a lot of great male leaders, obviously. But women should also be given the chance, should they be qualified, to go for those positions. Um, they but a lot of women, <clears throat> not a lot, but some women suppress mm -hmm. their... That, that is true. Uh, their, their leadership right. qualities. They, they may have, um, they may exhibit um, risk aversion, or it's confused for risk aversions, but women are more strategic with their risk. Um, for example, you know, we know that men are willing to take more risk than women. You know, they'll go and they'll gamble the farm, you know, for, you know, a business investment and a woman may be a little bit more prudent. But when you look at the decisions that women make in organizations, women are more strategic with their, their financial decisions, their investing, and those organizations that she does lead, they tend to have higher revenues, they have a better uh, uh, return on their investments. So but research has shown that what you're saying is, is, is true. However, they send the highest successful rate in that area. It's not the single woman. It's the woman who marry. Right. Well, and that's because in, um, in relationships, when you have that partner that is supporting you, when you have supportive partners, mm -hmm. right, because uh, unsupportive partners can be, a re can be a career killer as well. Yes, yes. But, um, but if you have a supportive partner, yes, that, that, is, that is true, um, as opposed to single women. The key to it is to have the best supportive network, the best supportive village possible. Um, stemming from your parentage, you know, from, from birth all the way through to encourage you to take chances, to explore education and self-discovery. But society still, whether it is, you know, from your own family or from the church or community leaders, uh, still expect women to make the bulk of sacrifices uh, for the family. So women are leaving the job force to have families. Women are taking uh, a back seat to their husband's careers. And, there, you know, there are some women that are just not confident. And, and this begins to show up um, right around the first, second grade. Um, really? Yes, the first or second grade is where it begins, the, the lack of confidence begins to show up as girls become aware of the gender differences that society is displaying more and more. So studies have shown that boys will raise their hand to answer a question even when they don't know the answer. <laughs> more times than not. That's true. Girls, <laughs> girls will not raise their hand even when they do know the answer. 
Why not? Because they're afraid of what the boys will think about them. Really? They begin to become aware that if the boy is not dominating the relationship, then he's not interested. Mm. So I've got to make a second grade and even as early as the second grade. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So why is a woman considered a better politician? Well, for the things that you mentioned, you know, the honesty, the ethics, people want to believe that their politicians are honest and ethical. Even if a woman isn't honest and ethical, because she may be attractive, may give you the illusion that she's honest and ethical. You know, features come into effect. Features come into effect. Mm. You know, there's uh, there's pretty pr- privilege. You know, things like that that have you know been studied. It's but that a, could be the same thing for males, though. It could be the same things for males. You know, um, you know, taller men, you know, tend to do well than shorter men. You know? Fat man, better it, skinny it, man. Exactly. Stop. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but um, you know, even they say you know women are better at being spies. You know? Yeah, that's true. I yeah. was active duty, and a lot of the spies in Russia was females. Right, because it's hard for a man to believe that someone that attractive that's true. would be evil. So they're given the benefit of the doubt in, in that situation. So, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. Very, very interesting topic. And I didn't know how that topic was going to go. But once yeah, you Nicole, surprised me there. <laughs> once Nicole loosened up and she gave us uh, her 15 minute bio, then I <laughs> knew that I had her. <laughs> Nicole, what do you have for my audience going out? Well, um, what I want to talk about is um, a little bit what we touch on the politics, right? Um, you know, we're at a time in our country where you know many of us feel that a lot is on the line. And uh, we have a, a very big decision, you know, coming up in, in November, uh, November 5th. Um, there is no makeup exam. We've got to get this one right. And uh, I'm also running for office. Uh, you know, I will hear, you know, people say, like, you know, one party doesn't do enough or, you know, th- they're, you know, there's no trust in politics and so forth. And I want to say that we have to vote in the support network for our politicians that we want to support. And so I'm running for county commissioner, District 4. And uh, we have um, uh, a few seats coming up um, for vote. And uh, there's District 2, 4, and 6 that are going to be on the ballot. And and there's a primary race on August 20th. Uh, Myself and another Democrat is running uh, to be on the ballot in November. And so people have a choice whether they want me or my Democratic opponent to be on that ballot uh, to go against a Republican opponent. So August 20th is an important date. Today is the last day to register to vote for the primaries. And uh, oh, August, yes, today for the primaries, which will be on August 20th. Uh, October 7th will be the last day to register for the general election. So your... Um, your deadline to register is always 29 days before the election. About mail-in ballots? Uh, mail-in ballots today as well. So today is the last day to register to get your mail-in ballot. Uh, they will start accepting mail-in ballots on August 5th. Um, but the actual election day for the primaries will be August 20th. So if you register today, you're receiving the mail when? Um, you should receive it in the mail within a few days. And you can go to the Hillsborough County Supervisor of Elections. You can check your voter registration status. Uh, you can update your party affiliation, change your address, whatever it is that you need to do. Um, but, um, you know, the, the primaries is just as important uh, to know who you want to be on the ballot. And, uh, and if you're already registered, great. Come out and vote on August 20th and also uh, November 5th. But to that, I say to people, well, you know, don't just vote for me um, because I'm a black woman, or don't just vote for me because I'm a woman. Uh, Don't just vote for me because I just told you to, and, you know, I'm the first politician that you met. Vote for me because you know that I'm the most qualified candidate to be in that office. And, and, And I spoke about my background in finance and education and all the things that I do in finance. Um, I am also the president of the Hillsborough County Black Chamber of Commerce. So I stay involved in the community. 
helping to build entrepreneurship skills, helping to connect people with resources. And that's also what I continue to, pl- what I plan to continue to do in the office of county commissioner. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. We appreciate you being on the show. And you can also vote for her because she got a card where you can't miss it. She got on both sides. <laughs> so you see the face right there. Who am I going to vote for? Bam. <laughs> Here we go. Back to this again. Purchase my book. I am advertising it big time. Purchase my book. Also subscribe to me. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, my audience. I appreciate you. Till we meet again. Thank you and goodbye.